Given our ever-increasing reliance on cloud storage, it's no surprise that cryptographic research is aimed to help us provide access controls on untrusted platforms. Today I'm going to discuss some of the issues, some of the practical considerations that are going to go into accomplishing this goal and demonstrate that the state of the art at the moment cannot yet fully achieve it without overheads that are likely to be prohibitive. So I don't think I need to tell anyone here, and you've been told a couple of times already throughout the conference, that there's been a huge explosion in the popularity of outsourcing our data to the cloud. There's a wide array of offerings from many companies targeting both the enterprise, things like Amazon Cloud Drive, to the very consumer level, things like Flickr. But how does this affect access control? Traditional access controls are enforced by a trusted reference monitor that's going to field our requests and deny those that shouldn't be permitted. Well, in the cloud scenario, it's possible that I don't trust my service provider to enforce my policy correctly. It's possible that I'm worried they may permit an access that I don't agree with. It's possible I'm even worried that they're going to be hacked and leak my files, something that happened to over 100 million people just last year. So in short, if we don't trust the storage provider, who's going to play the job of the reference monitor? Well. Advanced cryptography seems like it could help us out here. It seems like it could be the key to working through some of these issues. It's very likely that even if I don't trust my storage provider, I will trust the math behind advanced crypto. So if I can encode my policy via encryption and let the crypto enforce it for me, all of a sudden it's taken the weight off of my provider to give me this uh, trusted reference monitor. And we have increasingly expressive options to accomplish this. Identity-based encryption, hierarchical IBE, uh, attribute-based encryption all through predicate and functional encryption. And the literature on these often seems to assume, uh, in times implicitly, that there isn't a reference monitor needed if we trust this crypto to enforce our policies. Well, this works great when the state of the system is fairly static. Files aren't edited very often. The policy doesn't change that much. But what I'm going to show today is that there are costs of using advanced crypto that are unique to dynamic settings. Scenarios where I'm editing files a lot, scenarios where I'm revoking accesses and things like that. So if the policy is changing or the files are being edited a lot, it's unclear what the costs of using advanced crypto are going to be, and so that's what we're investigating in this work. To give a brief overview of the remainder of the talk, we're going to start by looking at a construction for enforcing access controls using identity-based encryption, and then we're going to talk about some of the issues with that straw man construction to motivate a better construction, and at times we're going to be making security concessions for the best possible efficiency. We're going to try to be as optimistic as we can about the costs of using advanced crypto to enforce access control. We're then going to evaluate the costs of using that construction and talk about where we'll, go, where we'll go next in terms of research to help make this more feasible. The system model that we're operating within includes an organization that wants to outsource its files to the cloud that has administrators who'd like to update this policy as time goes on, as well as regular users who are going to have file accesses. And we have a couple of really simple goals for functionality here. We want to enforce common access control policies. We want the organization to be able to keep the same type of policy it's been using. We want to allow both read and write accesses. And we want to be able to allow policy changes, including, importantly, revocations. We want to be able to take access away from users if necessary. So that's it, those are our, our main goals here in supporting access controls on the cloud within this system model. In particular, we're going to be enforcing role-based access control, or RBOC. We wanna be able to enforce existing policies, and so we're going to be looking at the most common enterprise access control system. In this system, we'll have uh, a set of users, a set of permissions, which we can think of for the purposes of this talk as a set of file accesses, uh, a set of roles that are going to act as a level of indirection between the users and file accesses, and users will be assigned to roles, they'll belong to roles, and the UR relation will represent the user role binding. Accesses will then be granted to roles, and the PA relation will represent the permission role binding. And a user can access a file if she is a member of a role which has been granted access to the permission in question, access to the file that she's trying to access. So let's take a look at a straw man construction of how we could represent RBOC, enforce RBOC using identity-based encryption. Let's bring back the right half of that RBOC example here, uh, the PA relation. We can grant file accesses to a role using identity-based encryption by encrypting the file to a shared role identity. 
if a number of users share this uh, identity, we can encrypt this file to that role, and then all of those users will be able to access that file. So uh, we can, in this case, encrypt file one to the shared identity role one, and encrypt file two to the role identities R1 and R2. It's important to note here that that means we have to encrypt this file twice. We have to make sure that both uh, users in role one and users in role two will be able to access this file. Well, now we have to distribute these roles key, role keys excuse me, to users in that role. We can do that, we'll bring back the UR side of the RBOC state here. We can do that by encrypting these keys uh, as key bundles to their individual identities. So I can encrypt the private key for identity role one to the identity for user A. Similarly, user B should have access to the private keys for roles uh, one and two, and C should have access to the private key for role two. So now if user A wants to access file one, for instance, user A will download the key bundle, the role key, to get access to the private key for role one, which has been granted to them. They'll then use that role key to decrypt the contents of file one, which is encrypted using the identity for role one. So in a static scenario, this seems like it works really well. I can represent this state. Everyone can access the things they're supposed to be able to. Uh, but what happens when things start to change? For instance, how can C, user C, update the contents of file two, given that it's accessible to users in other roles? How do we enforce that only users A and B are allowed to write to file one? In identity-based encryption, anyone who knows an identity can encrypt to that identity. So how do we enforce that these users can't overwrite files that they're not meant to be able to edit? And finally, how do we revoke B from role R2? How do we take accesses away, given that this user's likely caching these keys locally? B could be saving the private key for R2 uh, on his machine. How do we revoke accesses, given that that's a possibility? So given these issues with the straw man construction, we're going to look at uh, fixing these issues and accommodating um, a, a dynamic scenario using a, a more a different construction. It's important to reiterate that as we develop this construction, we're making concessions to make sure that we're being optimistic about the costs. We want to favor efficiency in order to get, in a sense, a lower bound on the cost of supporting uh, access control using advanced cryptography. So we're going to choose efficiency over the best possible security, and we'll revisit tightening up those assumptions later on. So the first thing is I'm going to bring back the role keys that we had before, and I'm going to look at adjustments that we can make to the storage of files to enable users to write to those files. The first thing is that we're going to use hybrid cryptography. We're going to encrypt the files with a random symmetric key, and then use IBE to encrypt those symmetric keys to the roles that should have access to them. Now we no longer need multiple copies of the file. We have only one copy of file F2 here, and we have two copies of the key used to decrypt file F2. We also don't need to IBE encrypt large data. We don't have to encrypt the entire file using this very expensive advanced crypto. We can take advantage of faster symmetric key crypto. And finally, updates are much simpler now. If user C wants to write to file two, it's as simple as re-encrypting the new file and uploading it here and replacing the contents of F2. The user doesn't have to worry about what other roles have access. They don't have to worry about uh, replacing multiple copies. They just upload a replacement to this file. We also note that the file key metadata now is going to specify what type of access the user has. Do they have read-only access or read-write access? This is going to allow us to check whether or not a write is allowed. Well, now there's another level of indirection here. If user A wants to access file one, they first have to download the role key as before, use that role key to decrypt the symmetric key for that specific file, use that symmetric key to decrypt the file. But by introducing a minimal reference monitor who's going to check some identity-based signatures, some IBS signatures, uh, we can make sure that writes are only permitted if they are being done by a user who's a member of a role who was granted read-write permission to this file. So when I wanna upload a file update, I have to sign that using IBS, and the minimal reference monitor will check that that signature is valid and that the write is allowed. Now I'll also note that all of these tuples are actually going to be digitally signed with IBS, but I've suppressed that notation here for simplicity. 
All right, so now we can do writes. We can enforce that only certain users can write to a file. But we still don't have a simple way to support revocation in the scenario that we're assuming these users could be caching keys. What we're going to do to handle this is use key versioning. We'll first, we'll first look at versioning for file keys. Uh, when we're encrypting our files now, we'll specify which version of the key for this file was used to encrypt this file. Similarly, in our file key bundles, we'll also specify what version of the key is contained in this bundle. So now when a user wants to decrypt a file, they'll have to make sure that they get the correct key bundle, depending on the version. And we want, when we want to revoke access to a file from a role, we'll generate a new file key, encrypt it to all the roles who should continue to have access, and then upload all of those uh, adjusted key bundles onto the, the server. So for instance here, if I wanted to revoke role one's access to file two, this is the tuple that I'd want to delete, but deleting it here isn't good enough. The user could be storing the contents of the key and can continue to uh, download and decrypt this file as it changes through the future. So instead, we're going to purge that and then rekey the file, replacing this copy of uh, the file key for role two so that role two can continue to access, uh, but role one no longer does have access. We would also like for this file, the file contents themselves to be re-encrypted, but we're not going to do that on the spot. We're going to re-encrypt lazily. Um, on the next write, the next user who's going to upload a copy of this file, they'll encrypt that with the new key. Uh, so users know which key to use if there are multiple copies of the key on the server, uh, and the newest one is the one that's always used to encrypt. And the, the user who caches keys now can't get anything that they couldn't have fully downloaded and kept a copy of uh, anyway. We're going, to do a similar, we're going to use a similar system for role identities and that will version each role identity. And then anytime we need to remove a user from a role, we'll generate a new version of the role identity and corresponding role key and distribute those only to the remaining members. So for instance, if I'm removing B from R2 here, again, this is the tuple I'd like to delete, but I can't simply delete it because B could be caching the keys. I'll re-upload another version of this role identity private key encrypted to the identity C, the only user who still has access to this role. All right, so that's how we're going to handle revocations in this system. So from there, we can accomplish all those goals of the system model that we talked about a couple slides ago. And in places, we've made concessions like using lazy revocation. Uh, but still, managing this is quite complex. And obviously, I can't go through all the details of this construction here, but I want to highlight just one command. And even this one, I don't expect you to be able to read that and internalize all of the notation on the spot. But I want to point out a couple of things. There are two situations here, one where we're revoking only write access and leaving the uh, the user to have read-only access, in which case we download the file key tuple. We generate the new version, the one that now specifies read-only as the permission. We re-encrypt it, re-sign it, re-upload it. However, if we're revoking all access, this is the scenario in which we need to re-key. So we'll re-key the file, generating a new file key, encrypting it to all the remaining roles, and uploading it onto the server. And when we're revoking a user, not just revoking one permission from one role, if we're removing a user from a role entirely, we'll actually have to do this for every file that the role could access. That way, the user could be caching not only role keys, but also all the file keys for the role uh, while they were a member. All right, so now that we had our construction, we needed to evaluate it. And we wanted to look at a wide range of both data sets and administrative behavior. We're going to use an actor-based simulation to analyze this. And our administrative behavior here is modeled by a continuous time Markov chain where we have parameters that allow us to uh, look at the effects of different amounts of revocations, different frequencies of revocation actions. We also utilized real life uh, RBOC data sets. These are widely cited in the role mining literature and there were a wide variety of kind of shapes of, policy, of, uh, of initial states here, both user sparse and user dense, both permission sparse and permission and so on. So we executed this simulation and we recorded the counts of operations, the amount of data transferred, and so on. And what was immediately clear is the costs of revocations. This can cost up to thousands of metadata tuples needing to be regenerated. And, this, and in, in this scenario, that means download, verify the signature, uh, decrypt, adjust whatever metadata you need to adjust, potentially generating new keys, uh, re-encrypt, re-sign, re-upload all back to the server uh, thousands of times 
before your revocation has been affected in the state of the server. Well, we wanted to then manipulate the administrative behavior, twist around those parameters a little bit, and look at the different frequencies of revocation to decide how dynamic a system needed to be before this posed a problem. We found that even at 10%, costs were already starting to blow up. Even if only 10% of the administrator's actions are toward revocation, the costs are going to be become a problem already. So we've tried to engineer this system to make it as feasible as possible, sometimes at the expense of relaxing our security model, but even only 10% of the administrator's actions being revocations makes this likely impractical. Well, what if we wanted to tighten up the system and eliminate some of those efficiency uh, optimizations? We could get rid of lazy encryption by making the administrator re-encrypt the files at the time of revocation, but this is going to mean tens or hundreds of files needed to be re-encrypted on the spot, further delaying the state change taking effect. We could weaken our trust in the reference monitor, and we talk about a couple of ways we do that uh, in the paper, one of which includes file versioning, but requires the uh, reader of a file to download potentially many copies and verify a bunch of signatures. We also looked only at IBE in the talk, but in the paper we discuss the difficulties that will, uh, ex will get even larger uh, when we look at more expressive advanced crypto. For instance, we looked at hierarchical RBOC using uh, hierarchical IBE and found that managing the hierarchy was very expensive. And when we looked at ABAC, uh, excuse me, attribute-based access control using attribute-based encryption, we saw that the cost would scale with the policy. And in both scenarios, our crypto costs were increasing quite a lot. Well, by studying these issues, we've highlighted a couple of ways, uh, a couple of important areas of future research to make this practical. We're working on advanced revocation techniques that work on both parts of the hybrid crypto so that we can use something like, say, proxy re-encryption without the concern that the user could have cached the file keys. Uh, we're, working, we're looking to reduce the reference monitor by using trusted hardware, something like SGX. Um, and we're thinking about ways we can eliminate the cryptographic levels of indirection that mirror the RBOC levels of indirection. So in conclusion, we assumed a really simple system model we looked at a mild amount of dynamism, we made optimistic design choices, and we showed that still the costs of using advanced crypto for access control on an untrusted platform are likely prohibitive, highlighting the importance of those areas of future research that I mentioned in order to make this goal achievable. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions you have. Maybe a very silly question, but is your work also applicable if you don't even consider advanced crypto, if you, if you do things just using semantic cryptography? And what does public key crypto actually buy you? I'm, I'm sure. Um, so public key in general is going to buy us the ability to verify or write without the ability to read the files. If we used only symmetric key crypto, then the server can uh, read as long as they can verify. Uh, so we need at least some form of public key. And in the paper, we also talk about investigations that used traditional public key crypto, something like a PKI, um, and found that the conclusions are largely the same, that uh, it neither wins the game for us or breaks it if we, if we switch to these more advanced crypto. Um, so yeah, we looked at both. So uh, I thought that was really good work. Um, I just had a kind of a tangential question. Did you guys think about like audit logging at all when you do all this um, re-encryption, you're essentially throwing an original file away and you're re-encrypting it and at some point that's either akin to somebody overwriting a file and making a new one or whatever, but there's at some point when you have like a document retention scheme or something like that, you wanna know that a, a record exists and it has existed, even though it's been re-encrypted and it's technically a new file. I don't know if you guys thought about that at all. Okay, so something like a versioning system. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, so we looked at the versioning system as an alternative to having this reference monitor, um, not necessarily as a standalone contribution, but as a way that we could uh, take away our trust in the reference monitor to enforce that a write was allowed. Um, and essentially the way this works is that um, we keep every single copy of the file. Some of them will be signed and valid, um, by someone who was allowed to make that right, and the user will have to download all of the recent versions to figure out which of those is actually a valid right. Uh, so we didn't look at it from that perspective, but we did look at uh, could we use file versioning to help make the system a little bit um, more secure, I guess. <laughs>